Hello everyone. How are you today? I hope you are doing great. This is Dr. K. Nagendra from Maulana Azhar National Urdu University from the Department of English. And today I came up with another important topic that is So it's very important to talk about uh, a brief history of English language teaching and learning to understand like what was the English language teaching in earlier and today's. So let me ask you a simple question. Why do we need to know the history of English language teaching and learning? Do you think that it is essential? Yes, I think so. We need to know the history of English language teaching and learning because there have been so many changes in language teaching and learning throughout the history. And it is also important to know how ELT used to teach in ancient times and how to teach now. If you observe throughout history of ELT carefully, foreign language teaching and learning has always been an important practical concern. When it comes to theories, there were so many theories about the learning and teaching of languages have been proposed. These theories normally influenced by developments in the fields of linguistics and psychology have inspired many approaches to the teaching of second language and foreign languages. Let me talk about uh, what is the history of English language teaching because it's very important to know the history of English language teaching. Like if you go back and see how they used to teach ELT. In the western world 16th, 17th and 18th centuries foreign language learning was associated with the learning of Latin and Greek, both supposed to promote the speaker's intellectual. At the same time, it was very important to focus on grammatical rules, syntactic structures, along with rote memorization of vocabulary and translation of literary text. Latin and Greek were not being thought for oral communication, but for the sake of speakers becoming scholarly or creating an illusion of sophistication. But they hardly focused on oral communication. Knowledge of Latin was needed for the study of the Bible and for the academic purposes like the study of medical books and legal documents. Like they used to teach this Latin language in order to study the Bible and at the same time and even they used to teach this Latin like to read medical books and legal documents. Let me talk about uh, French as a lingua franca. Like as you all know that this is also one of the important and old languages. French was the language of diplomacy in Europe from the 17th century until its recent replacement by English. As a result is still working a language of international institutions and is seen on documents ranging from passports to aid mail letters. For many years until the accession of the United Kingdom, Ireland and Denmark in 1973, French and German were the only official working languages of the European economic community. French was also the language used among the educated many cosmopolitan cities across the Middle East and North Africa. And let me talk about two important persons. They are Kelly in the year 1969 and Hawat in the year 1984 have demonstrated that many current issues in language teaching are not particularly new. It's a fact that 60% of today's world population is multilingual. Multilingual I mean like people those who are well aware of or those who are able to speak more than one language. It is also well known fact that English is the world's most widely studied language. But 500 years ago the world's most widely studied language was Latin and today we've been talking about English but it was not like that earlier. The Latin was dominated language. Latin was the dominant language of education, commerce, religion and government in the western world. Coming to the 16th century, like there were three important popular languages. Sometimes even we call them as romance languages and we can also call them like world languages or sometimes even we can also call them as a classical languages. But here in 16th century, like there were three important popular languages. They were French, Italian, English. English gained importance as a result of political changes in Europe and Latin gradually became displaced as a language of spoken and written communication. But slowly 
English regained its place. What is the status of Latin language today? Latin language diminished and became occasional classical language. So it means that I want you to understand when I say occasional, it means that we hardly use that and maybe rarely. The study of classical Latin, the Latin in which the classical works of Virgil, Ovid and Cicero were written and analysis of its grammar and rhetoric became the model for foreign language study from the 17th to 19th centuries. Here I would like to tell you one thing. See, they used to take a Latin language as a model, like how they used to teach Latin language and Greek. The same carried on even English. Children started entering into grammar schools in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries in England were initially given a rigorous introduction to Latin grammar rules. So it says clearly, see they used to focus on sample sentences, parallel bilingual text and dialogue that carried on same even today's English. Schools learning must have been a deadening experience for children for lapses in all knowledge were often met with a brutal punishment. See here like children hardly show that interest to learn a new language because it was a kind of punishment sitting in a four walls and to learn that uh, language. It was really a difficult task for the children because they didn't have any uh, creation and innovativeness or uh, there was no interaction. There were occasional attempts to promote alternative approaches to education by Roger Atchum and Montague in the 16th century and Comenius and John Locke in the 17th century made specific proposals for curriculum reform and changes in the way Latin was taught and this was the reference from Kelly in the year 1969. Let me talk about uh, three important ELT terms. They are method, approach and technique. We often get confused, don't you? I came to know that many of the students will always get confused when they hear these three important terms. Do you think they are the same? I don't think so. Let me talk about one by one, like how method is different from approach and how method and approaches are different from technique. Method is a set of procedures, a plan that tells us specifically how to teach a language. Coming to approach. An approach deals with different theories about the nature of language and how languages are learnt. These theories are based on a set of assumptions with deal with linguistic and psychological factors that are accepted for the acquisition of languages. But what is technique? Technique is a classroom device or activity. Examples, dictation, imitation, repetition, etc. What is the teaching method? Yeah, there is a similarity because as I already talked about uh, what is method. But teaching method is all about a way of teaching a language which is based on systematic principles and procedures. It is also an application of views on how a language is best thought and learned. So it's very important to know like uh, the brief history of English language teaching like if we want to understand very clearly about a brief history of English language teaching and learning, we need to uh, study grammar translation method. Are you ready? Yes. We can also call it as a GTM which stands for grammar translation method. Grammar translation method can also be called as a classical method. The reason behind calling it as a classical method, like there were three important languages, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit and these are all the famous and well-known languages as you all know like if you go back and see the history. That's the reason like when you say that a grammar translation method, we call it as a classical method. Some of its leading exponents suggest John and Seed Tucker, Karl Plodge, H. S. Wollendorf, John Medinger. Like these were the famous persons who talk about a grammar translation method. Grammar translation method was offspring of German scholarship. W. H. D. Rose quoted in Kelly in their 1969, page number 53, to know everything about something rather than the thing itself. So it is very clear like if you want to understand something 
like instead of learning so many things, it is very important to concentrate on one particular thing to know more and more about it. Grammar translation was in fact first known in the US that is United States as the Prussian method. See, do not ever get confused with the terms when I say that grammar translation method, it can be called a classical method and in United States, it can also be called as a Prussian method. What are the characteristics of GTM? Let me talk about one by one. Detailed grammar analysis, rules followed by an application of this knowledge to the task of translating sentences and text into out of the target language. Here target language means like suppose take an example of suppose if you are learning a Urdu, like if you are at the same time if you are learning an English, Arabic or any other languages, like since Urdu language is your mother tongue, English is going to be your target language because you are learning it is a formal situation. The first language is maintained as the reference system in the acquisition of second language. See suppose if you come from a medium of Urdu background, like whatever the sentences, vocabulary or even other stories, they will try to correlate with your first language that is nothing but mother tongue that is Urdu. So, first language is maintained as the reference system in the acquisition of second language like that was the couch which was given by Stern in the year 1983. And other characteristic features of grammar translation method, reading and writing are the major focus. Like as you all know that like there are four important skills in language uh, teaching. They are L, S or W, listening, speaking, reading and writing. But when it comes to grammar translation method, they used to focus much on reading and writing, but they completely neglected other skills. Little or no systematic attention is paid to speaking or listening. Vocabulary selection is based solely on the reading text. They never teach a vocabulary in a contextual manner, but they take in it as a isolated. Like suppose you just imagine that like suppose if I give a word, like you will forget about it. If I tell you a sentence, you will remember it. So, that is the difference in grammar translation method. They used to come up with a vocabulary like which are, which are not there in a sentence. The sentence is the basic unit of teaching and language practice. They never come up with uh, a contextual stories uh, like or any other material. They used to go with a sentence and sentence and sentence. Accuracy is emphasized. Here accuracy I want you to understand like students are not allowed to make any mistakes. That is what I spoke about uh, in the beginning of uh, this class, okay. Like there I told you that like children used to get a brutal punishment. Uh, so here accuracy is emphasized. It means that they are not supposed to make any mistake and there would not be any possibility for creativity and innovativeness. Grammar is taught deductively. This is also one of the important characteristic features of grammar translation method. Like what is deductive? Are you aware of the deductive method? Let me explain you what exactly a deductive method. Deductive method is all about uh, like first they usually give more rules than examples. So, deductively is all about uh, like when we go with the rules, automatically students will feel bored. That is what happened in grammar translation method. This used to be one of the important feature of uh, grammar translation method. Students native language is the medium of instruction. Like they never make use of a target language as a medium of instruction because uh, they always uh, uh, took uh, a first language as a reference. That is why students native language, it means that whatever the mother tongue you used to have uh, or maybe you have, that is what happened in grammar translation method because they have taken like native language is the medium of instruction. Suppose if your mother tongue is Urdu, they have taken it as a model and they taught with the help of this Urdu language, they taught even English. Students need to learn about grammar rules and vocabulary of the target language. See here, like they focused much on grammar rules and even a vocabulary which are not in a contextual vocabulary, just isolated and grammar rules. The other features of grammar translation method, the rules are very traditional. Like as I already told you that like there is no creativity and innovativeness, like very traditional, very monotonous. 
the teacher is the authority in the classroom. See, it means that it is completely a teacher centered. There is no interaction between a teacher and students, but only teacher dominates. You do that and you do not do that. So, it is all about a teacher dominated and completely teacher authority based. So, there is no like a kind of in, any interaction and discussion. Students are taught to translate from one language to another. Suppose, in order to promote or in order to teach this target language, they used to translate from one language to another language. The best example is, suppose if I give you one sentence in English, like they used to ask students uh, to translate from their mother tongue to English. That is what, but it sometimes it did not work out. Little interaction among students. I already told you that like there is little interaction or no interaction at all because it is all about teacher dominated classrooms. Literary language is considered superior to spoken language. It is not just all about your day to day communication, but they focused much on literary language. Cultural language is considered superior to spoken language. Like even a culture also played a crucial role in order to learn a language. Culture is weaved as consisting of literature and the fine arts. The language that is used in class is mostly a student's native language. Here, even though they are teaching English or any other target language, but they used to focus much on the student's native language. Here, native language I want you to understand, it is the student's mother tongue or maybe first language. Grammar translation method dominated European and foreign language teaching from the 1840s to and 1940s and modified from the continues to be widely used in some parts of the world today. Like even though it was one of the oldest methods, uh, but there are some modified method of GTM still used even in some parts of the world. In the mid and late 19th century, opposition to the grammar translation method gradually developed in several European countries. Like what are the changes which have been taken place? Let me talk about uh, language teaching innovations in the 19th century. Like here, like why did they oppose? Like what is the necessity to come up with uh, a criticism of this grammar translation method? Like here, we are going to talk about all of them. One is increased opportunities for communications among Europeans created a demand for oral proficiency in foreign languages. Prominent specialists Marshall, Prendergast, Goyen uh, created a new teaching strategies for learning language teaching. The work of individual language specialists like these reflected the changing climate of the times in which they worked. Let me talk one by one because it is very important to talk about them because they came up with a very interesting strategies for English language teaching. Let me start with the Frenchman C. Marshall, like from 1793 to 1896. Marshall referred to children's language learning as a model for language teaching. He also emphasized the importance of meaning in learning and respond. Reading should be taught before other skills. See here, like he clearly says, reading should be given a first importance. And he even tried to locate language teaching within a broader educational framework. Let me speak about the Englishman of Prendergast. Prendergast was one of the first to record the observation that children use contextual and situational cues to interpret utterances, that they use memorized phrases and routines in speaking. He also proposed the first structural syllabus from 1920 to 1930. Learners should be taught the most basic structural patterns of language. Another famous Frenchman, F. Guyen, from 1831 to 1896. Guyen is the best known of this mid 19th century reformers. Like I have been talking about Marshall, Prendergast, and finally Guyen. Like here, Guyen played a crucial role in mid 19th centuries. Guyen developed an approach to teaching a foreign language based on his observations of the children's use of language. He also believed that language learning was facilitated through using language to accomplish events consisting of a sequence of related actions. Let us have a look at a Guyen series 
like what exactly a sequence of ideas are all about, how they play a crucial role in order to learn a language. I walk toward the door, here I walk. Second one is, I get to the door, I get to. I open the door, I open. So, this was the agreement series like which played a crucial role in learning a language. Guyen emphasized on the need to present new teaching items in a context that makes their meaning clear. He also highlighted the use of gestures and actions to convey the meaning of utterances. See, it is very, very important to make use of hand gestures. Action speaks louder than words. So, Guyen spoke about the importance of gestures and actions in language learning, how they convey the meaning of utterances. These practices later became a part of such approaches and methods of situational language teaching and total physical response. We can also call it as a TPR. Educators recognized the need for speaking proficiency rather than reading comprehension and grammar. The ideas and methods of Marshall, Prendergast, Guyen and other innovations were developed outside the context of established circles of education and hence lack the means of wider dissemination, acceptance and implementation. So, there, there was no sufficient organizational structure in the language teaching profession. By the end of the 19th century, teachers and linguists began to write about the need for new approaches to language teaching and through their complaints, books, speeches and articles. The foundation for more widespread pedagogical reforms was led. This effort became known as the reform movement in language teaching. Henry Sweet in England, Wilhelm Wieter in Germany and Paul Posse in France. And these are all the practical minded linguists began to provide the intellectual leadership needed to give reformist ideas greater credibility and acceptance. The discipline of linguistics was revitalized. Linguistics is all about the study of languages. Linguists emphasized that speech rather than written word was the primary form of a language. When it comes to reform movement, all these linguists, they emphasized much on speech rather than written word. Fanatics, this is also one of the drastic changes which have been taken place in reform movement. What is fanatics? Do you have any idea? Let me tell you what exactly a fanatics is, how it plays an important role in spoken communication. Fanatics is all about the scientific analysis and description of the sound system of languages was established by giving new insights into speech process. Simply we can say that fanatics is all about scientific study of speech languages. And this was the time where all these practical minded linguists came up with IPA. The International Fanatic Association was founded in 1886. The IPA was designed to enable the sounds of any language to be accurately transcribed. One of the earliest goals of IPA was to improve the teaching of modern languages. And IPA also promoted some important uh, strategies in language teaching. The first and foremost thing that is the study of spoken language. Fanatics training in order to establish good pronunciation habits. So, if you want to learn a new language, it is very, very important to be good at pronunciation. The use of conversation text and dialogues to introduce conversational phrases and idioms. See here, they completely give an importance on conversational text rather literary text. And even these people also focused on dialogues like which talks about day to day communication. An inductive approach to the teaching of grammar. This is also one of the drastic changes which took place in reform movement. Inductive approach. I hope you remember I already talked about a deductive approach that is deductive method. But what is an inductive method? You may be puzzling by looking at this new term. Inductive method is all about uh, its exactly opposite to deductive method. In deductive method, we used to give rules first, then examples. 
that's how students used to feel very bored about it. That's why in reform movement and these practical minded linguists came up with an inductive approach. It means we need to speak about more examples first. You try to correlate with their day to day life and come up with more examples then you speak about rules. So it became one of the popular ways uh, you know, to teach a grammar. So these practical minded linguists made use of this inductive approach. Teaching new meanings by establishing associations with the target language, not the native language. And here also, like they did not make use of native language or students mother tongue, but they try to explain in target language itself. Let me talk about uh, Henry Speet from 1845 to 1912. Henry Speet argued that sound methodological principles should be based on scientific analysis of language and study of philosophy. In his famous book, The Practical Study of Languages, in the year 1889 he wrote this. He set forth principles the development of teaching method. This included a careful selection of what is to be taught, imposing limits on what is to be taught, arranging what is to be taught in terms of the language, particularly in terms of the four skills. They are listening, speaking, reading and writing. And last but not least, that is grading materials from simple to complex. These are a very good ideas and which plays an important role in reform movement. Look at the first one that is careful selection what is to be taught. Like one has to have a clear idea like what has to be taught in classroom. Like we cannot go a dump of materials but we need to go with the, some limitations. So we should have some limitations what to be taught in classroom. Next this is also one of the important techniques uh, according to Henry Speet what we can use in, in a classroom that is arranging what is to be taught. Yeah, let me share uh, one of my experiences. There are many experienced teachers or like people those who are well qualified. Like they got a lots of information in their mind but if we don't organize everything is going to be vain. So it's very very important to organize uh, in terms of uh, L, S or W skills. They are listening, speaking, reading and writing. And grading materials also, that is also one of the important uh, because simple to complex. It is all about known to unknown, easy to difficult. So if that was the idea like which was given by Henry Speet in order to promote a language. He also strongly criticized the inadequacies of grammar translation method, so called classical method or Prussian method. Next important person Wilhelm Wieter from 1852-1918. Wilhelm Wieter, the prominent German scholar, argued that training in phonetics would enable teachers to pronounce the language accurately. He also talked about speech patterns rather than grammar were the fundamental elements of language. In 1882, Wilhelm Wieter published his views in an influential complaint, language teaching must start afresh. In this, he came up with so many ideas like how to teach a language, like what are the new strategies which we can implement in language teaching. And he also strongly criticized the inadequacies of grammar translation and stress the value of training teachers in the new science of fanatics. Coming to the all the reformers like you take an example of uh, Henry Speet, Wilhelm Wieter and etc. Like in general all these reformers believed uh, that a spoken language is primary oral based methodology. Fanatics should be applied to teaching and teacher training. Learners should hear the language first, words should be presented in sentences, grammar should be taught only in context, translation should be strictly avoided. You are not supposed to translate from one language to another language that has to be very strictly avoided. 
the other important thing I wanted to tell you that like whatever the grammar which you wanted to teach, teach them in contextual rather just giving us sentences. All the members of the reform movement, Henry Sweet, Wilhelm Wieter, Paul Poshi provided suggestions on how these principles could be best put into practice. The reform movement was an interesting in developing principles for language teaching and learning such are seen in the first language acquisition. Like they took a model of a first language acquisition, how a child's a learner language. So that was the model like which they came up with and finally this led to what we have been termed natural method and ultimately led to the development of what came to be known as the direct method. So far we talked about a brief history of English language teaching. In this we talked about how Latin and French and other languages have played a crucial role and how they influenced even teaching a target language called that is English. And we also talked about uh, who came up with uh, a new strategies. We talked about linguist and we also talked about a practical minded linguist and even their views. We also talked about uh, grammar translation method like how grammar translation method is and what are the characteristic features of grammar translation method. And even we also came to know that like what was the opposition like why they criticized GTM so called grammar translation method. And later we also talked about uh, the innovative methods in language teaching. And we also discussed reform movement. The three important persons I want you to remember Henry Speet, Wilhelm Wieter, Paul Poshi. And these three people came up with so many ideas and changes uh, in language teaching. I hope you enjoyed the session. If you want to know further readings, approaches and methods in language teaching that is Richards C. Jerk or Rogers. The second important one is techniques and principles in language teaching. Third one, the practice of English language teaching by Jeremy Harmer. If you are really interested or fascinated about uh, this teaching or learning an English language like there are some suggested books you can just have a glance and go through them so that you would love to read them so that you can collect a lots of information which talks about brief history of English language. For further information you can also contact me on Thank you. Bye for now.